very much. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming along. I'm delighted uh, to be here. I see a few familiar faces uh, in the audience who I've met, I think, over the years at various migration conferences. Um, as Pavel said, uh, for two years now I've been uh, based at the Immigration Policy Center, the European University Institute. And part of my work there um, contributes to an international uh, research alliance called MEDAM, which is funded uh, by the German Mercury Foundation. And there are three institutions in that project, uh, the Kiel Institute for the World Economy in Germany, uh, the Center for European uh, Policy Studies, and uh, the Migration Policy Center. And the aim really is to do research, rigorous research, that contributes to debates about uh, reforming European migration and asylum policies. And the project has been going on for three years, and it's just been renewed for another three years. Uh, what I'm presenting today is part of that <coughs> overall research program. And what I'm going to focus on is ongoing research on what Europeans think about asylum and um, migration policies. Today, I'm focusing specifically on asylum and refugee policies. And the paper I'm presenting is a joint work with uh, my colleague uh, Anne-Marie Janet from the European University Institute and also with Esther Adema and Tobias Stör from the Kiel Institute for the World Economy. The paper is now available um, in the working paper series of the Robert Schuman Center at the EUI. So what are we trying to do? Uh, the context uh, and the motivation of the paper is of course familiar to everybody in the room, which is simply that there have been very large debates about uh, asylum and refugee policies in Europe over the past few years, not least since the very large inflows of asylum seekers and other migrants in 2015 and 16. And there are big political pressures to try to reform uh, how Europe is protecting asylum seekers and refugees. Various reform proposals have been put forward by both the European Commission, European Council, but also by various national governments. And these reform proposals really offer very contrasting ideas about what needs to be done. Some people argue what we need is more solidarity at the European level. So we need more Europe, uh, including perhaps mandatory redistribution mechanisms um, of, of uh, asylum seekers or refugees. Others are saying, no, we need even stronger national governance. And uh, what we need, for example, is to focus much more on protecting refugees in first countries of asylum, in lower and middle income countries, rather than in, in Europe. Uh, there are some countries, including uh, Austria, where I'm originally from. Some of you will know that there has been an Austrian-Danish uh, vision statement that has basically proposed that we try to put much more emphasis on helping migrants and refugees outside Europe. And uh, the Austrian government, until recently, the previous uh, government in Austria, um, has tried very hard to reduce the number of asylum seekers coming to Europe. So how we think about protection of asylum seekers, how we think about resettlement, how we think about returning asylum seekers whose applications have been unsuccessful, all of these issues have been very hotly debated, but we actually know very little about how the public thinks about these issues across the different countries. I mean, that, might, that statement might surprise some of you. We have, of course, a lot of research on the determinants <coughs> of attitudes to immigration in general. There's a big research literature around that. There's much less research um, on attitudes toward refugees and asylum seekers in particular. And there's almost nothing, really, on uh, how people think about policies that are aimed at offering protection to asylum seekers and refugees. And this is in a way where this research is trying to contribute. How do people think about the kind of policies that should be in place vis-a-vis -vis asylum seekers and <coughs> refugees? And in our view, the key to asking this question lies, or the key to answering this question lies in recognizing the multidimensionality of the issue. So there have been some um, studies that have looked, that looked at isolated aspects of asylum and refugee policies. So for example, if there's a re re redistribution scheme, what principles should this scheme, this scheme be based on? Um, should we have fewer or more refugees and asylum seekers? Should we have 
fewer more resettled uh, refugees. What we say is, well, in practice, asylum refugee policy is a multidimensional issue that needs to address a number of questions at the same time. It's not only about fewer more asylum seekers, it's only about what rights are people given when they arrive here, what family unification rights do they have, for example, what protections do they have in terms of being bent, sat, sent back uh, if their applications are unsuccessful. So what we do really is the, to exa we examine the public support for asylum and refugee policy, and in particular, the extent to which is con this is contingent on certain policy features. So we're trying to get away from the idea that people either support protection or they don't support protection. And we're trying to analyze what are the attitudes towards specific, specific design features of the policy. I mean, it sounds like a, a very obvious point to make that when you analyze support for policies, you look at not only at the binaries, but you look at actually how these policies are made. But of course, in public debate, typically, we, we have this binary. Either you're for it or, or you're against it. So we're looking particular at how particular aspects, policy aspects, features, influence support for the overall uh, policy. Um, now you'll see in the research design that we have used, we do actually use specific examples of policy features. Uh, but what we're trying to do is not so much find out support for these very policy features, but we're trying to investigate support for the basic principles underlying um, asylum and refugee policies. So we use the, the specific policies that we, that we test in a way, just as a way of trying to reflect underlying policy features. And we ask to what extent Europeans are willing to move away from the status quo of the international asylum system. And by that I mean basically the Geneva Convention and also some European regulations. So the contributions are that this is the first ever analysis of the public's multidimensional preferences. And as I said, we go beyond the binary and specifically we explore how people think about offering conditional protection. So that is protection to asylum seekers and refugees using certain limits and conditions. So it's not, it's not all or nothing. That, that's what we're trying, trying to do. Um, so the first step, and there's, there's basically three steps to the analysis. First of all, we have to conceptualize asylum and refugee policy because we say it's a multidimensional issue. So we need to first of all decide, well, what are the key issues that we want to look at? As a second step, I'll talk about the methods and the data. And the third step, I'll present some, uh, some results. Um, and then I hope we can have a discussion about some of the results. Also, what, it, what these results mean or should mean for policy debates. So the first step is to talk about uh, what we mean by an asylum and refugee policy. As I said, it's a multidimensional issue. And in our view, there are four types of issues that I think need to be captured in any attempt to um, analyze uh, asylum and refugee policies in a multidimensional way. Uh, the first dimension or the first issue um, is an obvious one which relates to how refugees and asylum seekers access protection in EU countries. So there the question is, how do we regulate the asylum process? Yes? To what extent are asylum seekers free to come here? And when, once they're here, to what extent are we examining their applications for asylum? Are there, any, are there any limits, for example, to the numbers of applications for asylum that we process in every year? And in some member states, of course, we've seen calls for limits, for an annual limit. Um, in Austria, we've seen that. In Germany, we've seen that. Of course, the Geneva Convention uh, doesn't foresee any limits. The f f uh, countries that have ratified the Geneva Convention are obligated to examine applications for asylum uh, without an annual limit. Now, the second way to access protection in Europe uh, is through resettlement. So that is uh, people who are currently outside Europe, often in refugee camp camps, but not always, in first countries of asylum. And their status is recognized by the United Nations, by UNHCR, and they then get transferred, they get resettled directly into um, host countries, such as European countries. So with resettlement, in a way, there's no question about the status of the refugee. It's the status of the person seeking protection, as we all know, with asylum applications, there are big debates. And the big processes are trying to establish 
whether or not a particular person qualifies for asylum and should be granted refugee status. With, with resettlement, the status determination has already been made and the person is transferred. So that's resettlement. Uh, the second uh, aspect, I think, relates to the quality of protection. So it's not only access, but also how do we treat uh, asylum seekers and refugees after they, they arrive. Uh, one important issue, for example, is what rights to family reunification do they have? To what, to what extent is that right uh, limited? Another um, important issue is how we deal with asylum seekers whose applications have been unsuccessful. Under what circumstances, if ever, can they be sent back to dangerous places? Again, a uh, non refoulement principle underlying the Geneva Convention says that you should not send people back to places where they could face serious harm. Again, there are big debates about the conditions under which this perhaps should be, should be possible. A third issue is how the governance of uh, this whole system is um, made up in terms of the balance between national governments and the role of the European Union. Again, big debates. How much should we Europeanize our asylum and refugee policies? And finally, I think, I think this is also an important uh, issue to think about. Uh, to what extent should European countries or any other high-income countries provide financial assistance to low- and middle-income countries hosting large numbers of refugees? Uh, we all know that the vast majority, about 85%, of the world's refugees are not in high-income countries but in low- and middle-income countries. So only very few um, uh, refugees, for example, get resettled uh, to Europe um, in, in global comparison and uh, the number of uh, asylum seekers in global comparison in Europe is also uh, uh, not as large as some people always think. So these are the issues that we're trying to, to get at in terms of conceptualization. Now, what we then do in terms of the method, um, we carry out what's called a, a conjoint experiment, survey experiment in uh, eight different European countries. Uh, the countries are Austria, France, Germany, Hungary, Italy, Poland, Spain, and Sweden. Um, uh, it's an, it, the survey is carried out online uh, by a survey company, uh, a Respondi. We have 1,500 individuals per country, so 12,000 respondents in total. And I, I'll explain the method uh, in, in, in just a minute. Um, the survey starts by first of all uh, explaining to respondents what we mean, or what is generally meant by the terms asylum seekers, refugees and resettlement, because there's a lot of confusion. Um, often in people's heads about what these, these terms mean. So we wanted to be clear that uh, resettlement um, involves people whose status is already recognized, whose re refugee status is already recognized. Asylum seekers are people who come and ask for, for, for protection, and refugees are people whose status is already recognized. And what we, what we do next is we present people with uh, five conjoint tasks. So as, as I will show you in a second, uh, we define an asylum and refugee policy as a policy that varies across six policy dimensions. So there are six policy features in each policy. Uh, there are six dimensions, and within each dimension, there are two or three different potential values that this dimension can take on, two or three different potential features. I'll just show it to you. It'll be easy to understand. And what this methodology does, it randomly generates and asylum refugee policy by randomizing the policy features within each dimension. And then people are asked, they're presented with two policies, policy A and policy B. Each policy you can think of as a package of six policy features and people are asked, do you prefer policy A or do you prefer policy B? And that happens five times. So five times respondents are asked if they prefer policy A or prefer policy B. And in addition to that, we also ask them to rate the policy uh, from one to seven. A higher rating mean, means that they like the policy uh, more. So I'll just uh, uh, go through some of the policy dimensions. So we have six policy dimensions that we analyze. Um, and these are based on the four kind of key issues that I outlined before. The first one relates to applications for asylum. So there's two possible policy features that the policy can take on in a random way. I mean, in the policy that's presented to respondents, only one of these features will appear. Uh, the first one tries to resemble the status quo. 
anyone can apply for asylum in your country without any limits. So that is trying to say, well, you know, anybody who kind of shows up on your territory and asks for asylum, uh, this person's claim will be uh, examined. Policy B tries to um, interrogate or explore the issue of limits. Anyone can apply for asylum in your country until an annual limit is reached. Again, this is trying, we're not trying actually to test support for the specific proposal of an annual limit. Of course, we will get information on that. But we're trying to find out if there is a public preference for moving away from the general principle of, pro of assessing asylum applications in an unconditional way, in an unlimited way, as is currently, currently the case. The second dimension um, refers to resettlement of recognized uh, refugees. So should there be no resettlement of UN recognized refugees to your countries? Should there be low resettlement or should there be high resettlement? Now whenever you do a cross-country study, of course, it's always very difficult to use words like low and high because they might not only be interpreted differently by different people within the country, but they might also be interpreted differently across countries. So this is why we actually put numbers um, on those particular options. So by low resettlement, we mean one person per 10,000 citizens in your country, right? So if you in Poland, if you divide the Polish population by 10,000, um, that's what you, what you would get. High resettlement, two or more persons per 10,000 citizens uh, per, per year. Okay, so, to, so we explore again to what extent do people um, uh, support resettlement. The third one, the third uh, rela uh, dimension relates to return to harm, what we call return to harm, return to dangerous places. This is basically about non reformal Option A, again, trying to come close to the status quo. A refused asylum, refused asylum seekers are never sent back to countries where they could face serious harm. I mean, this is what international law currently requires. And option B, in some cases, refused asylum seekers can be sent back to places where they could face serious harm. Now, we didn't want to specify the conditions under which one, under which this occurs. We just wanted to find out, in principle, are people open to the idea of sending people back under certain conditions, whatever those conditions m might be. Uh, I said we have six dimensions, so four more. The fourth dimension relates to family reunification. Again, option A, status quo, more or less. A recognized refugee can always bring his or her spouse and, and uh, children. Of course, family reunification is not specifically mandated in the Geneva Convention, but the European laws and policies which generally uh, allow for this right to family reunification. Um, option C, in a way, is the most restricted option. There's no family reunification. Policy should have no family unification um, uh, for anybody. And um, option B, in a way, is trying to test the conditional, a conditional option again. Recognized refugee can bring his or her spouse and children only if the refugee can pay for the cost of living. Now, this is actually a proposal that is being currently debated in various countries, for example, in Sweden. Uh, and, and this idea that family unification is conditional on the primary migrant's ability to pay for the living costs is something that's very common in labor immigration policy making. Those of you who study labor immigration policy will know there's typically a self-sufficiency requirement or a minimum income threshold that you need to meet in order to bring family members in. It's a relatively recent development as far as I know that these kinds of ideas are now also being brought into asylum and refugee policies. Uh, the fifth dimension is about the role of the EU. Uh, option A, each country makes its own decisions on asylum application within its territory. I mean, this is the status quo, that this is a national government competence. And uh, option B here suggests that a centralized European Union agency decides applications for asylum for all EU countries. Now, I should explain a little bit. I mean, this is a very sharp question on EU governments. I mean, this is an extreme version of more EU involvement. This actually implies that there's a centralized EU agency which assesses and decides on applications for asylum in all the countries. So uh, I should add that, of course, there are many other ways in which we could have more Europe that doesn't go to that extreme. But we just wanted to test this, this sharp idea of basically leaving assessment and decision-making on asylum to a European Union agency. And finally, on financial assistance uh, to non-EU countries hosting large numbers of refugees. Um, first option is that there's unconditional financial assistance. So European countries help 
uh, places like um, uh, Lebanon, uh, places like Jordan who host large numbers. And option B is a conditional option, which says we help, but only on the condition if uh, the country helps us reduce the number of asylum seekers coming to Europe. Okay, this is a conditional option. Uh, again, you can see that some of these policies are actually being already put into place. A lot of European governments and European Union as a whole, of course, is in discussion with a lot of first countries of asylum about ways in which they could actually help reduce uh, migration to Europe. And the final option is uh, that there's no financial assistance to non-EU countries at all. So again, these are the six policy dimensions. The policy features within each dimension and what the method does, it randomizes, it generates a policy by randomizes uh, within each dimension. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. So this, this is an example of a conjoint task. That's policy option A and policy option uh, B. Uh, so what you see here is here are the dimensions that I just talked about. Now first of all, the order in which these dimensions are presented is also randomized across respondents. So in this case, we begin with resettlement. And then uh, we randomly pick one policy feature within those um, policy dimensions. Okay, and then you have two different policies. Now in this example that I'm showing you, it so happens by chance that along the first four dimensions shown here, the policies are identical, they're the same. Okay, so in this case, the randomization picked the same features here, but the policy differs in terms of the last two uh, dimensions here. So financial assistance to non-EU country. In this case, we have unconditional financial assistance to non-EU countries. And in this country, in this case, policy B, we have <coughs> financial assistance only <coughs> if countries have re reduced the number of asylum seekers coming to Europe. And similarly, there's a difference with regard to family unification of a recognized refugee. In this case, there's an unconditional right. Um, a recognized refugee can always bring spouse and children and in this case, it's conditional on paying, being able to pay for the living costs, okay? So that's what we call a conjoint task. Respondents look at this, they have to say, do you prefer policy A or policy B? And they have to rate the policy, and they do that five times. So that way, uh, even though we only have 12,000 respondents, we actually get ratings of 120,000 policy profiles, because each respondent assesses 10 profiles because there's five conjoint choices, okay? Uh, so that's the idea. And what, what, that, what that policy allows us to do, sorry, what that methodology allows us to do is to assess the impact that a particular policy feature has on the overall acceptability of the policy, of the asylum and refugee policy. So that's what we're trying to do because our research question was is, to what extent is support for the overall policy package dependent on the design, so on the specific policy, policy features? So I'll get to the results in, in, in a minute. So what we do is we analyze the results. I'm show, I'll show you a number of charts by computing what's called the average marginal component effect. Um, and what that shows you is the, the impact of a particular policy feature on the probability that the overall policy is accepted compared to a reference category of a policy feature, averaging out over all the other policy dimensions. I'll, I'll show you that uh, in a second. So what it allows us to do is to say, if policy feature X is in place relative to a reference category Y, for example, if you have an annual limit on the uh, number of asylum applications that are being assessed, What's the impact of that on the probability that the overall policy is accepted compared to a reference category of having no limit? Okay, so the reference category is always within the dimension. As I said, the unit of analysis are not individuals, but are the rated policies, of which we have 120,000. Um, yeah. So I'll first show you the results for all eight countries together, and then I'll go through some of the, some of the country results, and then and then I'll finish, and I hope we can have a discussion. Um, uh, uh, I'll be happy to take some questions, but we can also have a discussion about what that means, what it should mean, what it might mean for policy making and policy debates. Okay, so here are results um, for all, all countries. So what this chart shows you, again, 
are the average uh, marginal component um, effect. We're looking at all countries, and what this shows you is the effect of a policy feature on the probability of accepting the asylum refugee policy, on the, on the probability of accepting the overall policy. Now what you see here on the zero line, so these are the reference categories. So in this case, this is, these are the dimensions here, asylum, resettlement, return to harm, family unification, decision making, and financial solidarity. So that's financial assistance to non-EU countries. The dots on the, the, the bold uh, dots here on the dotted line are the reference categories. So what this tells you is all the things, all the estimates on the right here are policy features that increase support or that people view favorably, that increase support on the overall acceptability of the policy features. And all the estimates here on the left are policy features that have reduced support compared to the reference category. So for example, compared to a policy, an overall policy, that has no limits on the annual number of asylum applications, having a policy um, that has an annual limit, you have an increased uh, probability here by about five percentage points. Okay? So people prefer, people prefer an overall policy if the policy has an annual, an annual limit here. Uh, on resettlement, what you see, so we have the confidence, we have estimates here, uh, and we have confidence, 95% inter confidence intervals here. So whenever the confidence interval crosses the zero line, that means that we don't have a statistical difference to the reference category. So what this tells us here on resettlement, that by and large people don't distinguish in a big way be between no resettlement and low resettlement, but high resettlement is viewed quite negatively. So policies that including a, a high resettlement in the overall policy option reduces public uh, support. Now, what's interesting here, um, because what one question that we ask ourselves is that if we feel this experiment, what are we going to find? And of course, we read the papers, and sometimes we get the impression from public debates that the European public is very hostile, um, very hostile to refugees and asylum seekers. So we're wondering, are they going to pick our most restrictive options in all cases? Now, we don't find that. We don't find any evidence that Europeans prefer to eliminate protection altogether, quite the opposite. So on non refoulement for example, sending people back to dangerous places in some cases actually has and reduces support, reduces support uh, for the overall um, asylum and refugee policy. So people do not like the idea of sending people back. Similarly, on family unification, denying family unification altogether, on the left here, is never possible, reduces support for the overall policy compared to unconditional um, family unification. However, the most preferred policy option in this dimension by far is the idea of making family unification conditional on the refugee's ability to pay for uh, living costs. On, um, on the EU, what we find very consistently across all our countries, with one or two exceptions that I'll mention in a second, um, having an EU central agency in the policy results in reduced support. Yeah. So having an EU agency assess asylum applications and decide on application leads to reduced support for the overall policy. And finally, on um, the financial solidarity, the most preferred option is conditional solidarity with non-EU countries um, compared to, to, to none. Um, but unconditional solidarity, so financial assistance without limit, uh, re reduces support. Okay, so these are the results for all the countries. So broadly, I think, what we can see here, we, what we take from this, broadly speaking, that Europeans in general are committed, we argue, to the idea of providing a degree of protection and assistance to refugees, <laughs> in the sense that they do not systematically prefer the most restriction option. So they do not like sending people back to dangerous places or denying family unification altogether. However, what comes out of this work is a clear preference for policies that use limits and conditions on, on asylum, on the number of asylum uh, applications, on family unification, and also on, on financial assistance.
Um, and again, we can have a discussion about the extent to which some of these policies, if they were implemented actually, would move away from current principles uh, of the international system. Now, as I said already, I think having an annual limit on the number of asylum applications is, I'm not a lawyer, but I think this would clearly be incompatible with the basic fundamentals of the Geneva Convention. So public opinion has a very strong preference for having an annual limit. Uh, so we should have it, we could have a discussion of what that means or what we should do with that um, information. Okay, let's go to country, country results. So the broad message on the different country results is that we were surprised about the remarkable similarities across the countries we looked at in terms of this overall broad pattern. By that I mean a preference for providing protection but uh, using certain limits and conditions. And I'll show you the country charts in a second, but when I say similarities, I also mean uh, countries um, uh, like Hungary and also Poland, whose governments have been much more uh, critical of refugees than some of other governments in European countries in recent years. So across all the countries we have looked at, we argue there's uh, fairly similar, a fairly similar picture emerges of support for protection but using certain limits and conditions. Uh, but there are some, some differences. Okay, so here's Poland. So again, this is a, a, a national representative sample of 1,500 people who answered this, uh, uh, who took part in this experiment in Poland. So you see, as I said, um, you see similarities A preference for annual limits, no um, low resettlement compared to no resettlement does not increase or reduce support. Um, high resettlement reduces support on the left. Sending people back to dangerous places reduces support among our Polish respondents. Denying family unification completely reduces support. Um, a very strong preference for limiting family unification to those who can pay for the living costs of incoming family members. Um, again, negative impact of the EU central agency. One different, we haven't tested this systematically, but this effect, the magnitude of this effect appears to be bigger than in some of the other countries. So in Poland, having a central EU agency assess asylum applications has a bigger negative impact on the uh, acceptability of the overall policy. And in one way in which Poland is a little bit different is that, whereas in the other countries you'll remember there was a preference for providing conditional financial assistance, so the result was somewhere here. In Poland there is no, we didn't find that conditional assistance to non-EU countries um, increases or reduces support compared to the reference category. And unconditional assistance is negative, um, as was the case in, in other countries. So this is what we find in Poland. No, a similar picture, not radically different. Hungary. Again, uh, sorry, I keep pressing the wrong button. Uh, Hungary, preference for limits. One way in which Hungary is different is that both high and low resettlement reduce support. You saw in many other countries we had, we, we, we concluded that low resettlement does not increase, so there's no difference between no resettlement and low resettlement in terms of impact on public support. In Hungary, even low resettlement reduces support. Uh, as does high resettlement. But even in Hungary, um, sending people back to dangerous places in some cases reduces support. Denying family unification reduces support. Strong preference for uh, using limits and conditions in family unification. And a very strong um, uh, negative effect of involvement of a centralized EU agency. I think this is the biggest, in terms of the magnitude, this is the biggest effect that we find in terms of the uh, this variable across all the countries. And then again, conditional support, in this case, conditional support for financial uh, assistance to non-EU countries, and, and unconditional support is, is viewed as negative. Sweden, the Swedish picture is exactly like the overall picture that I showed you before. The Austrian picture is exactly like the overall picture I showed you before. The German picture, again, is very, very similar. Uh, one difference that we see here is that, I mean, this, this might be, this, it, 
confidence interval cuts across the zero line. So in most other countries, in all other countries really, um, denying family unification completely has a negative impact. In Germany, we don't see a, a statistically significant difference compared to uh, unconditional uh, family unification. But again, strong support for making family unification conditional on uh, being able to cover the cost of, of living. France, again, very similar, not much uh, to report in terms of differences. Uh, perhaps uh, one is that, as is the case in one or two other countries, there's no preference for conditional financial assistance to non-EU countries. Italy is quite interesting because I think it's the only one or maybe one or two countries where the EU central agency does not reduce support. So in Italy, we don't find that Italians, that having the EU central agency assess applications doesn't hugely increase support, but it doesn't reduce support. And again, we can, we can discuss why that might be the case. Perhaps it is the case that Italians would wish some more EU involvement, some more assistance from the EU, because they feel that uh, they've been bearing uh, with uh, a big part of the, they've been dealing with a big part of the issue and they want more assistance from other EU countries. Uh, and finally, Spain. I mean, Spain is interesting um, because in Spain, remember in Hungary, both in Hungary, low and high resettlement reduced support for the overall policy. In Spain, actually, both low and high resettlement increase, <coughs> increase support. So in Spain, people think about resettlement in a much more um, positive, positive way. The, the negative effect of denying family unification in Spain is much bigger than in some of the other countries. Um, and uh, on, these on these dimensions, again, Spain is, is, is fairly, fairly similar. But this is, this is, I think, quite interesting that uh, in Spain, there doesn't seem to be this negative effect of high resettlement that we on the overall um, on overall support for the policy. So, again, as I said, um, what what do we conclude from this? Well, we argue that it shows that Europeans are generally committed to policies that provide protection, but they prefer to use limits and conditions. And certainly, to my surprise, um, I expected some very significant country differences, we argue actually the overall pattern of policy preference is remarkably similar across the eight countries included in our study. And I think this challenges at least a little bit this common perception that, that we have, we also get from public debates in Europe, that Europeans are hopelessly divided um, on some of these policy issues. Now, of course, when we mean conditions, there's a lot more work to be done. What exactly do you mean by conditions? What type of conditions? But I think, generally speaking, we find no evidence that there's this widespread public support for ending protection. Uh, there is support for protection, but Europeans want uh, limits and conditions. And, and this particular conclusion holds across all of the countries that we've, um, we've looked at. Um, so more work that's going on uh, right now, and we'll have a new paper uh, next month that looks, tries to begin to explain you know, what are some of the correlates of some of these um, uh, views, so what are, some, what are some of the conditioning factors, what are some of the determinants of these views. So one issue we're looking at is to what extent policy preferences are linked to political trust. So the trust that people have in political institutions, both European Union institutions and national government institutions. And another issue we're going to look at early next year is the extent to which there people perceive of trade-offs. So to what extent um, there's a trade-off in people's preferences uh, toward policy features across dimensions. So is it the case, for example, that if people prefer to have an annual limit on the number of applications for asylum, are people then, do they become more supportive of, for example, resettlement? Um, or is it the case if, they are, if people want an annual limit, do they become more supportive of providing more, uh, more generous rights after people arrive? So those are the kinds of issues uh, we're going to look at. Um, I'll conclude by maybe just a couple of remarks because this in a way is, is um, uh, a very important um, issue going into the debate. Um, so we think that this is important work in the context of a project that tries to inform policy making. 
But I think it's a very important issue to discuss what exactly this means or should mean for public policy debates. So we are not doing this research because we believe that public policy should be based in all cases on public attitudes. Um, we do it because we are saying that if you want to contribute to public policy debates, you do need to understand why certain policies are made. You do need to understand what the public thinks about these issues. So that's why I think it's very important to find out how people think about these issues. It is also the case that a lot of politicians in Europe are presenting proposals um, of, of, of quite radical proposals based on the argument that this is what the public want. Okay, we need to change everything and we need to do this because this is what the public want. Well, we also think of our project as trying to uh, contribute to an analysis of what the public really want. I mean, is it true that some of the policy proposals that we see and being justified with reference to public opinion, is there actually this uh, public um, support there? Um, of course, uh, there could be instances of public policy making where public opinion is in one place, but there might be other reasons, moral le reasons, legal reasons, for which we might not want to follow public uh, policy preferences. However, I think it also makes sense to assume that in the medium to long run, to have a sustainable policy, we need to have at least a degree of public support. So I think for all these reasons, this kind of work uh, is, is, is helpful. I think it makes a contribution not only to academic research, but also the broader public policy debates. Thank you, I'll finish here.